Well, I thought we were finished with the series with part six, but we've got two more parts to go. Today I'm going to read from Isaiah 66, and this is also about the end times and the new heaven and the new earth and God's judgment and things of this sort. It's going to describe a little bit also about uh, what it's going to be like where we are going. Remember that our series is Eternal Life. Where are we going after this? So we'll learn a little bit more about this from Isaiah 66. Then our next video is going to be whether we're going to see our loved ones in heaven and recognize them. You know, this, this old idea in the churches, and I want to see if there's any substance for that in the scriptures. So that's going to be part eight. This is part seven. And I'm going to read from the Septuagint translation, which you can find on the website for download. This is the LXX 2012 UK version. There's an, a US version as well, but I chose the UK version because a lot of my education happened in Canada. And um, although it's kind of a hybrid between US and UK, English, there's a lot more UK because my professors were from England, from Oxford. Um, so, for example, my mentor was the Dean of Geography at Oxford, and he was the president and founder of the seminary that I attended. And the, my other um, supervisor for systematic theology degree was from Oxford as well, J.I. Packer. A lot of you probably heard of J.I. Packer. So we're going to read from Isaiah 66 today, and um, this is is going to start, we're going to start in, let me just have a look here a minute. We'll start from verse 1. Um, there are 24 verses, so it's not that long. There are some <laughs> chapters in the Bible that have a lot more than that. So let's go ahead and just read from verse 1 through the end of 66. Thus says the Lord. Let me check the connection here, because last video I didn't have it plugged in all the way. There we go. It's in. Good. All right. Stop shaking. Nothing to be afraid of yet. When we get through the chapter, you might be terrified, though. All right. Let's, let's go. Thus says the Lord. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of a house will you build me? And... Of what kind is to be the place of my rest? For all these things are mine, says the Lord. And to whom will I have respect? But to the humble and meek, and the man that trembles at my words. This is the core of the Christian walk. And I say this again and again and again. And when people come to the channel and uh, they don't come with this attitude, they don't come with this attitude. Every once in a while, someone will. And I praise God for them. But most of the people who come are belligerent, are uh, self-gratifying, they're proud, uh, they are here to cause strife, they're contentious. No matter if you show them from Scripture, they still want to struggle and, and wrestle and fight you. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. They don't respect the time that I put into this ministry at all. They don't respect the fact that I've got a lot of people coming here, and I can't, I can't minister individually to each and every one. I try, and I try to say something to everyone, but I cannot go into deep, great details with every single person. So if I do go into great detail with you, please respect it, that it's unusual. It's not the norm. And if I say, hey, I've already covered this in a video, or here's a playlist with videos where I cover all the different uh, questions you might have on this topic, don't disrespect me and start pushing on and say, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, what about this? Go watch the playlist. And, and I've, I've started to be less um, tolerant of people who do that. And finally just say, listen, if you're not going to respect the work, the labor of love that I pour out into this for the, the maturing and building up of the body of Christ, in making the videos, which are, listen, you can't deny it, 
they are very, very involved, deep, intricate issues. And if you watch the video just one time through, you're not going to get maybe 10% of what's there. You've got to watch it at least two or three times through in order to get at least 75, 80% of it. So you got to go, you got to respect the work of the Lord here because the Lord has prepared me and trained me and, and qualified me and, and called me and appointed me and I'm here. Now, if you don't want to respect that, then move along, go on somewhere else because you're not going to receive the word of the Lord. So go on. There's no business being here. But if you're here to hear the word of the Lord taught through a teacher in the church to learn to get roots that really true roots that go down deep and, and to grow and flourish, then you're welcome here. But do as I ask. And when I say, please go watch this video, or please go watch at least some of the videos in this playlist, some of the playlists have 100 videos in it, I understand. Each video is at least 30 minutes long. And that's a lot of time to put in, 50 hours, right? So I don't expect you to do all that and then come back. You know, but at least get in there and, and show that you are actually availing yourself of the teachings, the explanations, the scriptures that are in the videos. So what I'm saying is this, is that in, across all the videos, you'll hear me saying again and again, this humility is necessary for salvation. And you're going to say, Ron, no, faith is necessary for salvation, and that's all, faith alone. And I'm going to say, listen, you need to be careful not to keep imitating a heretic. Because this is heresy. To say that we're saved by faith alone is heresy. It's in direct opposition to God's testimony. He repeatedly says that that is a lie. And you insist on promulgating it. So if you continue to hold to it after a leader in the church says to you, point blank, this is a heresy against God. And he says, go look at this video, go look at that video, go look at this playlist. You will find out why. I have a playlist called Faith Versus Works. And you can go have a look at that. If you don't know, you know, wh well, where do I find it? Well, you know, that means you don't know how to use YouTube. Just the basic navigating of YouTube. You go to the homepage of The Rooted Word. Okay, so you'll see that, you know, wherever... Whichever video you're watching, below the video, it'll say the rooted word, click on it. That'll take you to the home page. When you're looking at the home page, you'll see the banner, which is that yellow with the brown uh, letters, the rooted word. It'll go, it probably has one of the symbols in it, too, with the cross. And then you'll see a menu. Below that, you'll see a menu. And on the far right, it says about. Well, there's a magnifying glass on either side of that, somewhere near that. And you click on that magnifying glass, the magnifying glass that looks like this, okay? <laughs> just like that. Just go ahead and click on it. And whatever you type in there will search only on my channel. And so you can type in there. Uh, if you're looking for playlist, type playlist after it. So go faith playlist or faith vs works playlist or works playlist or something like that. And if doing that, you can't find it, which sometimes... I can't find anything that way. I will go ahead in the back end and find it for you and give you a link. But please try that first, okay? Because I really don't have much time. I also am a business professional, so I run my businesses, okay? And I'm doing this on the side, ministering as I should, as the model that Paul gave us, and uh, being respectable and honorable by not asking for money from anyone for ministry, not even accepting donations. Someone wanted to give me donations, and I said, no, I don't, I don't receive donations at all. I've never taken a dime from ministry, and I will not. When I finished seminary, I, I told God I didn't want to go back into the church and start getting paid after having volunteered for a long time. It would compromise the message. When my family depends on 
the money from the people that I'm ministering to and I have to speak a message to them, I'm going to alter it some way, a little here or a little there, because I would be afraid of losing my job, you know, or something like that. So humility and meekness. It says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And you say, yep, 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 yep. No, 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 slow down. I mean, really take a look at that and think, hold on, what, what words are in here and where have I heard that elsewhere as an important thing in the New Testament? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Grace. This cheerful graciousness, that's how we translate it. Cheerful graciousness. Where is grace important? In our salvation. You will not receive grace from God, cheerful graciousness from God, unless you're humble. God does not give the proud cheerful graciousness. God gives the humble cheerful graciousness. The only way you enter in is through cheerful gracious is through humility and once you're in you have cheerful graciousness from God the only way you enter in is through humility either you humble yourself or God humbles you there is no other way verse 2 for all these things are mine says the Lord and to whom will I have respect who does God look up to does he have a father? Does he have a God who made him? His very name testifies that there's no force that gave rise to him. He has no parents who gave birth to him, and there is no God who created him. I am that I am. That's exactly what it means. I am by my own being. I have no one that I must pay respect to. He says, and to whom will I have respect? But then he says, but to the humble and meek. And the man that trembles at my words, the man who's in right relationship to me, how should you be towards the God of almighty vigor? You say vigor? Yeah, that's the word. It's not almighty. It's all vigor. So we keep the almighty in there to emphasize the vigor has to do with might. How are you going to relate to him? What's the proper relationship to the God of almighty vigor? He does not relent. He does not let up unless he chooses to. He doesn't wear out. He doesn't tire. I guarantee you will give up before he gives up. Verse 3, but the transgressor that sacrifices a calf to me is as he that kills a dog, and he that offers fine flour as one that offers swine's blood. Whoa. He that gives frankincense for a memorial is as a blasphemer. Now what are we talking about here? He says, but the transgressor. The sinner. The sinner who offers sacrifice to me, his sacrifice as, is as an abomination, a stench of death. Abomination literally means the stench of death. You smelled a dead animal. I'm sure you it sometimes smelled a dead animal, dead rat, dead mouse, dead something, dead cat, dead, dead dog. Or maybe one of your parents died and, and you didn't know it and you came a few days later and you smelled. It's an unforgettable smell. Skunks are like daisies compared to the stench of death. These are abominations. A sinner who's offering a sacrifice to God is as he that kills a dog. It's he that offers pig's blood. The pig is an unclean animal, absolutely unclean to God. And this
person's offering pig's blood as a sacrifice. Yet they have chosen their own ways, and their soul has delighted in their abominations. There's the word. So I was spot on with it. They have chosen their own ways. And I can testify to you today, at this very hour, that right now, in this time in history, nearly every Western Christian has chosen his own ways. They come to this channel, and they sit in judgment on the testimony of God. They sit in judgment on the doctrines of the church. They sit in judgment on the leaders in the church. They sit in judgment on absolutely everything they see and hear. They are an abomination to God. If you are doing that, you are a stench of death in God's nostrils. You are not part of the body of Christ. You are not connected to the head who is Jesus Christ. Do you understand? You say, Ron, you're being rough today. I'm being rough today because I'm fed up with it. Christian after Christian coming, pretending like they are masters of the testimony of God. Pretending to know every little word and iota and every thought of God from the scriptures. And sitting on judgment on every single little matter, even poking their nose into other people's business. When I'm having a conversation with someone through the comments and someone who I've, I've talked to a couple times in the comments directly to them come over and start poking their nose over here. Now, I like it when you guys encourage each other in the comments, but when someone comes over and pokes their nose in and starts accusing me of something I said to this person, that's not right. And that's indicative of this abomination that is spread across Western Christianity. Let's keep going. Yet they have chosen their own ways. It's not God's ways. It's your own way. You've only justified it with the name of God. Oh, God told me this. Oh, God spoke this to me. Oh, God taught me this. Oh, God gave me this dream. Oh, God gave me these words. Oh, God told me that you're evil. Oh, God told me that you're a false teacher. Oh, God told me this and God told me that. When did God take you into his confidence? You're a sinner. Why would God take a sinner into his confidence? Stop your sinning. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom and to shun evil is understanding. Not to read the Bible is understanding. To shun evil is understanding. You can read the Bible all day and never gain any understanding and be led down this way and that way and sew them together and, and try to piece it together and come up with a just absolute disaster. And you think that it's wise. You've gone your own way. Your own ways. Because there's not just one way you've gone. You've gone this way and that way and this way and that way and this way and that way. And you're all lost. You have no idea where you are. And you're taking the pocket knife out and you're scrawling God's name on every tree. See, I know where I am. See, God is with me. See? You're cuckoo. You've lost it. Yet they have chosen their own ways and their soul has delighted in abominations. Your soul has delighted in abominations. That means that your intellect has delighted in abominations and taken abominations into your mind, cherishing those and keeping them there. Your emotions have latched on to abominations. You have no shame in your emotions that have latched on to your abominations. And last, and the king of them all, your will, your fortitude, is delighting in doing abominations. And you've got to stop. You have to stop. Verse 4. I also will choose their mockeries I know a lot about that. 
I also will choose their mockeries and will recompense their sins upon them. Not to them, upon them. The weight of your sins. I also will choose their mockeries where you mock God, where you mock Christ, where you mock the church, where you mock the leaders that Jesus has chosen and appointed to help you and to protect the flock. And you mock them and mock them and mock them and you never cease. What does God say? He says, I will choose their mockeries and will recompense their sins. Give them what their sins deserve upon them. And let's see how they like that. Because I called them and they did not listen to me. And you who were mocking, I called you. I called you and you did not listen to God. And I called you and I called you. And some of you I have been extremely patient with. Over and over and over, Charlie. Just as an example. Or this, this other guy lately that I've been trying to be patient with, and he has just been belligerent. Constant belligerence. Snide, attacking, unwilling to watch any videos that I point him to. Oh, I don't have time for videos, but he'll write volumes in the comments. Oh, well, you know, it's different watching a video than watching a comment. You know, your videos aren't so light. Well, of course, if you want a real answer, but since you're not willing to watch a video and get a real answer, then why are you even here? Except to cause trouble. That's the only reason you're here. I'm looking to give you a name, a screen name, so you know who I'm talking about. Ralph Jensen. And he's not alone. Veronica Harwick, I've been patient with for months. And she continues to push and push and judge men and push and judge leaders and push. And she doesn't listen. She doesn't learn. She doesn't understand. These are the people that God is speaking of here. I will choose their mockeries and will recompense their sins upon them. Because I called them. Remember, God uses messengers like me, like Don, like Leyland, like other men who have been chosen by God to be messengers for him and to speak for him. Because I called them and they did not listen to me. I spoke and they heard not and they did evil before me. And you did evil before me as God's messenger. God saw that. God saw every word and every thought of your heart. And I pointed those out to you. And they did evil before me and chose the things wherein I delight, delighted not. They chose the things that they know that God is not happy with. They chose those things knowing God is not happy with it. You say, well, how do they know that God wasn't happy with it? Because I told them. I made a comment to, to one lady who was a kind of undermining um, Shayla, and she was trying to undermine her in a subversive way, and I jumped in and I rebuked her, pointing her to Galatians 5, saying that sedition is condemned and you will lose your inheritance in the kingdom of God. And, and of course, this guy, Ralph, jumps in and says, it doesn't say that anywhere in Galatians 5. I read Galatians 5. And so I, I put Galatians 5 out there and bolded exactly the three places where it says it in Galatians 5. And I put what I said exactly to that girl 
and I bolded exactly the things from Galatians 5. That means that his further comments of sedition, of strife and contention, of false accusations, which all of them violate that commandment, thou shalt not bear false testimony against your neighbor. And yet every one of these people that I'm talking about, every single one of them repeatedly commit that offense against God and against me. And even when I pointed out to them, they still continue to do that. They're judging in matters that they have no wisdom or position to judge. They have no understanding because they don't stop their sin. Not only that, they're not appointed as leaders to judge those matters. And yet they just rush in. Oh, I'm a Berean Christian. Don't worry, we're going to have a video very soon about that. Because that's a huge mistake. And I've talked about it extensively in a couple videos. But we're going to bring that into one video and just focus on it to give a correction for that attitude. Because it's absolutely wrong. That's the illness in the Western Christian, Christianity I've just talked about earlier. All right, so verse 5. Hear the words of the Lord, you that tremble, tremble at His word. Well, that's not them, because they're not afraid of God. And whom will I have respect but to the humble and meek and the man that trembles at my words? That's verse 2. So he's going to test them then. See if they tremble at his word. If they do, then he'll have respect for them. If they don't, then he won't. And when I spoke the word of the Lord to you, you did not tremble. You spit back. Some of you vomit back. Some of you pull your pants down, turn around, and, and crap on my feet. You're so offensive. Some of you are that offensive. Just like Martin Luther. You've heard me talk about him being the shit flinger. Not contested. Everyone knows it. It's not contested by anyone. It's well-documented history. Every time he saw this spirit come, try to stop him from being rebellious, he called it the devil. He, he would poop on the ground, grab it, and throw it in the direction of that spirit. Hear the words of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Speak you, our brethren, to them that hate you and abominate you, that the name of the Lord may be glorified, and may appear their joy, but they shall be shamed. They shall be ashamed. Let's say it again, verse 5. Hear the words of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Speak you, our brethren, to them that hate you and abominate you, that the name of the Lord may be glorified and may appear their joy, but they shall be ashamed. So even if they do, see the glory of the Lord. Uh, even if they do finally tremble at the word of the Lord and embrace it, they will have joy, but they will also be ashamed. Like this Ralph, if he were to tremble at the word of the Lord, if he were to embrace the word of the Lord and have joy in the word of the Lord, he would be utterly ashamed for what he's said and what he's done what he's thought. Verse 6. A voice of a cry from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord rendering recompense to his adversaries. And Veronica says, I'm not an adversary of God. I love Jesus. You have no idea what love is. From your comments, you have no idea what love is. I'm speaking of godly love. And from your comments, you may want to know Jesus, want to love Jesus, but there's something else standing in the way. Adversaries. Many of you do not even know that you're an adversary of God. 
Are you going around telling people about the lordship of sinful nature? You say, Ron, what is that? Lordship of sinful nature. That's where you say that, well, my sinful nature is my Lord. I can't help but obey it. As long as I live in this body, I am going to submit to the lordship of my sinful nature. You say, what? Where is that in the Bible? Yeah, exactly. Where is that in the Bible? And yet every one of those apostate churches that dot the hills of America teach it. Every Christian that you run into across the United States professes it. Oh, you know, well, yeah, I did sin, but you know, you can't help but sin as long as you're in the body. Oh, then you won't mind when your pastor is found sleeping with uh, five women in the congregation and his wife is in tears and his children are confused and his home is crumbling. Uh, you don't mind that then. Because, you know, he can't help it. As long as he in the, he's in the body, he can't help it. He can't keep his penis in his pants, can he? To be gruff about it. Why would you care? If you really truly believe that doctrine, why would you care that your pastor is going around making children with five, six, seven other women other than his wife? Why would you care? You who do such things and you who say such things are not are, you're not advocates of God. You are adversaries of God. You're opponents of God. You're the enemy of God. Pretending to be in the people of God. You're not. You are not. When you say that we can't help but sin, you're saying that sin is my Lord. You're saying the Son has not set me free from sin. You're saying that Jesus is not my Lord. Jesus said you can only serve one master, not two. You can only serve one. You can't serve sin and Jesus. Only one. Let's keep going. Verse 7. Before she that travailed uh, brought forth, before the travail pain came on, she escaped it and brought forth a male. That's what it says. Verse 8. Who has heard such a thing? And who has seen after this manner? Has the earth travailed in one day? Or has even a nation been born at once? That Zion has travailed and brought forth her children? But I have raised this expectation, yet you have not remembered me, says the Lord. Behold, have not I made the bearing and the barren woman? woman? Both the woman who bears children and the one who cannot? As have I not made both of them, says your God? Verse 10. Rejoice, O Jerusalem, and all you that love her, hold in her a great assembly. Rejoice greatly with her, all that now mourn over her. 11, that you may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolation, that you may milk out and delight yourselves with the influx of her glory, that you may nourish yourself off of her. But those of you who don't tremble at God's words are not in the body of Christ and you're not nourishing yourself off of Christ. Off of the church. Because the church is the bride of Christ, as is the New Jerusalem, which makes the New Jerusalem and the church the same. If you're unwilling to enter into the church, you will not enter into the New Jerusalem. Let's keep going. Verse 12, for thus says the Lord, behold, I turn towards them as a river of peace to those who are sucking off of the uh, Jerusalem. For thus says the Lord, behold, I turn towards them as a river of peace 
and as a torrent bringing upon them in a flood the glory of the Gentiles. Wow. He's bringing the glory of the Gentiles in like a flood upon them. Their children shall be born upon the shoulders, like lifted up, carried is what born, to bear, to born. Um, their children shall be born upon the shoulders and comforted on the knees. Verse 13, as if his mother should comfort one, so will I also comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Those of us who are in the church are in fact indeed comforted by God. Those of you who are outside of the church fighting against us will not be comforted by God, but your transgressions will be recompensed upon you. Verse 14, and you say, oh, you're just being spiteful. No, I'm being honest with you. And by you talking like that, you only prove that this is true. You still reject the words of the Lord. Verse 14, and you shall see, and your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall thrive like grass. Your bones, you say bones? What do bones have to do with anything? Well, if you've had some biology class where they've talked about the bones or about the immune system, because not only do the bones provide the physical mechanical support for the body, right? That the muscles are used to leverage and make motions and extend and grab. You can't grab if there are no bones in your fingers. How are you going to do that? It's just it's just like masses trying to, they're just going to be flinging around like that. You've got to have bones in the, inside of it in order to do that. Not only the mechanical advantage, but the immune system is all based in the bones. All based in the bones. Your bones will thrive like grass. And the hand of the Lord shall be known to them that fear him. Only to those who fear him. If you do not fear the Lord, then what's it say? The hand of the Lord will not be known to you. Oh, you know that you're supposed to, or you'll wish that you could, and you'll pretend like you can, and you'll speak like you can, but you don't. And we know that. We can hear it. We can see it. We know that. And the hand of the Lord shall be known to them that fear him. And he shall threaten the disobedient. Do you think that you can be disobedient and still be saved? No, you cannot. If you are disobedient, you will not be saved. If you are disobedient, you will not go to the New Jerusalem. There's a different destiny for you that he details here very soon. So he says, And the hand of the Lord shall be known to them that fear him, and he shall threaten the disobedient. And when I call you to stop being seditious, and you continue to be seditious. And I point out in Galatians 5, where God said through Paul that the seditious will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you continue to be seditious. All I have to say is God will threaten you. You are disobedient. Verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come as fire and his chariots as a storm to render his vengeance with wrath and his rebuke with a flame of fire. 
And you say, well, we're not appointed to, unto wrath. That's not for you. That's for us. That's for us who are obedient to God, who are not in heresy believing a pre-trib rapture. We're not in heresy believing in the lordship of sinful nature. We're not in heresy believing that we can be uh, saved only by the imagination of faith. I distinguish that from the, the works of faith. Because you who don't think you need to do anything to be saved, sit there on your couch and just imagine everything and think you'll be saved. And you don't have, any, you don't have anything of substance to show. There's nothing you've done from your faith. You've sat and watched TV. You've sat and watched YouTube videos like this one and think that you've actually done something. And you've done nothing. This is the, the imagina imagination of faith. But the actions of faith is different. That is saving. But you don't have that, so you don't have to worry, except about God's wrath. He says, For behold, the Lord will come as a fire, as fire, and his chariots as a storm, to render his vengeance with wrath and his rebuke with a flame of fire. Verse 16, For with the fire of the Lord all the earth shall be judged, and all flesh with his sword. Many shall be slain by the Lord. Verse 17. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens and eat swine's flesh in the porches and the abominations and the mouse, yes, mouse, the little animal, and eat the mouse and other abominations shall be consumed Together, says the Lord. They shall be consumed together. This is not about the time of Isaiah. This is about the future time. It says shall. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens, so they look like they're doing the right thing, purifying themselves, sanctifying themselves, but... They eat pig's flesh in their porches and the abominations and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. Verse 18, And I know their works, actions, deeds, and I know their works and their imagination. I keep bringing imagination into it because it's important. That's why God destroyed the earth with a flood at the time of Noah. Their, the imaginations of their heart had become completely wicked so that they were withering their ways on the earth. And I know their works and their imagination. I am going to gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. And I will leave a sign upon them and I will send forth them that have escaped of them to the nations, to Tharsis and Fud and Lud and Mosoch, and to Thobal and to Greece, and to the isles far off, to those who have not heard my name nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory amongst the Gentiles. Verse 20, And they shall bring your brethren out of all nations for a gift to the Lord. Now, we always talk about how, you know, grace is a gift, you know, faith is a gift from God, a free gift. But we never talk about how those who are saved out of, the, out of the Gentiles are a gift to the Lord. But it says so right here. And they shall bring your brethren out of all nations for a gift to the Lord, with horses and chariots in litters drawn by mules, with awnings to the holy city Jerusalem, said the Lord as though the children of Israel should bring their sacrifices to me with psalms into the house of the Lord. It says, as if. In other words, the Gentiles being brought to the Lord as a gift is as if we are sacrifices to God. We're not going to be killed. That's not what it says. It says, as if. And not all sacrifices are killed. Animal sacrifices are. 
But here it says, verse 21, And I will take of them priests and Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heaven and new earth, yes, Isaiah talks about the new heaven and the new earth. Verse, 20, verse 22 of chapter 66. For as the new heaven and the new earth which I make remain before me, says the Lord. So even at the time of Isaiah, the new heaven and the new earth are made by the Lord and remain before him. So shall your seed and your name continue. 23. And it shall come to pass from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath that all flesh shall come to worship before me in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Now that doesn't mean every person who's ever lived. That means all flesh that's alive at that time. And we'll find out next that that's true. It says, And it shall come to pass from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath that all flesh shall come to worship before me in Jerusalem, says the Lord. It's New Jerusalem. And they shall go forth from the New Jerusalem and see the carcasses of the men, those who have been killed, that have transgressed against me, sinned against him, sinners who never repented, for their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched. Their flesh is eternal in the state that it's in, being eaten by the worm, worms. You've got the flesh of the men who sinned against God and did not repent, that are kept alive, being eaten alive by worms. And their fire shall not be quenched. That means that we who are in the New Jerusalem will be visiting as tourists the lake of burning sulfur. We will see the living carcasses of those men where the worm does not die and their fire is never put out. And they shall be a spectacle to all flesh. We will be spectators. We will be tourists visiting and looking upon these things. Not just once. Eternal life. Where are we going after this? That's part of the new earth. And you know these things now. And you have no excuse for continuing to be an adversary of God. Give in to God. Make peace with Him. Stop fighting Him. May the Lord bless you as you seek Him. As you seek Him and give in to him with all your heart.